Hello and welcome to Insight Ophthalmology. This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to another lecture. Today we are discussing the complications of local anesthesia, specifically the anesthesia which is given with needles. That means the needle block complications. So first we shall be discussing the minor complications. The minor complications which can occur with peribulbar and retrobulbar anesthesia are the conjunctival edema in which the fluid gets collected in the subconjunctival space and which is called chemosis. Then we can have subconjunctival hemorrhage in which we can have bleeding below the conjunctiva which is also abbreviated as the SCH. Then we can have even bleeding into the eyelid tissue because of the injection and that is called echimosis. So in this picture also you can see the ballooning or the swelling of the conjunctiva which is also coming off onto the cornea and underneath that we see a reddish uh, tinge because of the hemorrhage. Now these minor complications are more common in peribulbar block because we are giving the, uh, the, the anesthetic agent is actually deposited into the uh, adipose tissue anteriorly. So this anterior spread of the local anesthetic agent uh, can also damage the minor blood vessels with the needle tip and therefore minor complications are more common in the peribulbar block. Now the minor complications can also occur with the subtenons block where we do not use the needle but we actually use a blunt cannula. So here because of the improper technique or because of using the metal cannula uh, and any forceful placement of the metal cannula it can cause pain on injection which is quite common about seen in 15 to 33 percent of the patients. It can cause chemosis which is seen almost in 100 percent subconjunctival hemorrhage in which range all which also ranges from 7 to 100 percent. So these are minor complications which can be managed. Coming to now the major complications of the needle blocks or the needle anesthesias which are given in the surgery. The first thing is and the most dreaded one is retrobulbar hemorrhage. Now retrobulbar hemorrhage is a very serious complication of both the intraocular as well as the ex sorry the intraconal as well as the extraconal block. So the uh, what is meant by retro means behind and bulba refers to the globe. So whenever there's bleeding behind the globe specifically in this intraconal space which is formed by the the uh, four muscles which are present behind the eyeball okay and they are enclosing the optic nerve within uh, within that space okay that is the intraconal space so whenever there's bleeding into this space it is called the retrobulbar hemorrhage now the retrobulbar hemorrhage or the bleeding could be either because of damage to the veins which are present in that area or it could be because of the damage to the artery specifically the ophthalmic artery which is present in that area now based on whether it is venous or arterial hemorrhage we will have different features a venous hemorrhage will usually be because of perforation of a vein and it is very slow in onset and it presents markedly with a blood stained chemosis that means there is ballooning of the conjunctiva but below that you will have the SCH that is subconjunctival hemorrhage so this is called blood stained chemosis and along with that because there is so much uh, blood uh, which is getting accumulated behind the eyeball that because of that blood formation because of hemorrhage there will be raised intraocular pressure and that pressure or uh, and that hemorrhage is going to also push the eyeball anteriorly and that anterior protrusion of the eyeball is called the protru uh, is called the proptosis so how do you actually take care of this venous hemorrhage? Uh, once you reject it, the treatment is you have to give intermittent digital pressure with a gauze piece uh, over the closed lids. So ask the patient to close the eyeball or you close the lids and then on top of that you put a gauze piece and then give digital pressure with your both hands. And the idea is basically here to reduce the intraocular pressure. Now I will tell you how to manage a retrobulbar hemorrhage. But whenever there is a case of retrobulbar hemorrhage, Mostly the case is postponed and the surgery is not undertaken. So this is how a case of retrobulbar hemorrhage can look like. Okay, so there will be increasing proptosis, there will be subconjunctival hemorrhage as you can see here and there will be chemosis. So chemosis along with subconjunctival hemorrhage is called blood stained chemosis. Now the retrobulbar hemorrhage could also be because of the arterial 
damage so the thing about artery is because the pressure in the arterial system is more the rbh which occurs secondary to the artery damage will also occur quite quickly and the pressure will also be very very high so in this case also you have to give firm digital pressure over the eyeball so how do you actually reduce the pressure so first is you will give uh, the digital pressure you can try some compression devices like the honen's ball and if the pressure does not get reduced with that the problem with the rbh is that the blood can get accumulated in that intraconal space and then it can com cause compression over the optic nerve which is sitting in the center of the intraconal space leading to increased pressure and because of this pressure on the uh, optic nerve this is called the compartment syndrome which can cause damage to the optic nerve so immediately you need to decrease the pressure of the eyeball so how do you do it the first thing that you can do is you can do a lateral canthotomy okay so lateral canthotomy is nothing but we have a uh, near the lateral canthus that means where the superior lid and the inferior lid will meet we have a tendon which is called a lateral canthal tendon this canthal tendon has two crusts that means two divisions like this one is the superior crust which is supporting the upper lid and the inferior crust which is supporting the inferior lid so in a lateral canthotomy you will actually cut up cut open your lateral canthal tendon by giving a horizontal nick over the lateral canthus meanwhile you also start the medical management in the medical treatment you will start intravenous estazolamide and along with that also sometimes you can start intravenous mannitol also if needed and of course you can do a paracentesis also so here in this first picture i'm trying to tell you what is meant by a lateral canthotomy so you can see this is a lateral canthus of the patient and so initially you uh, use an artery forceps and try to crush the skin or you put some pressure and crush the skin of the lateral canthus in order to occlude all the vessels which are present over there and then you take a scissor and cut open the lateral canthus of the patient and that will actually reduce the pressure of the orbit by creating additional space in the orbit if the pressure does not get reduced by doing a lateral canthotomy you can go ahead and do a cantholysis also cantholysis usually is done like this so over here you have the inferior limb and the superior limb so either of the limb you can actually cut and to provide more space into the orbit so you can do a superior cantholysis or you can do an inferior cantholysis so this picture over here shows uh, the creation of an anterior chamber paracentesis you can see here the paracentesis is being made so the idea is to uh, to drain some of the aqueous chamber from the eye in order to reduce the pressure of the eyeball or you can use a 20% mannitol iv solution as well so why does the rbh develops and what is the risk of developing rbh most of the patient who develop rbh they will have some pre existing vascular or hemorrhagic diseases and they might be using anticoagulants or antiplatelets like aspirin and warfarin it is usually advisable that the patient stops these uh, drugs at least 4 days prior to the surgery now also if you use very bigger needles the needles with larger bore okay like uh, 22 or 23 gauze needles like that they can also cause uh, rbh and they have more chances of causing or traumatizing any artery other thing is longer needles specifically more than 31 to 38 mm okay they will go and they will actually uh, they can injure any vessel so that is the reason why we say that we have to use the shorter length of needle appropriate length would be about 1 inch and it should never cross more than 1 and 1/2 inch okay So how do you prevent these RBH and the specific complication use a fine gauze needle specifically a 25 gauge needle then they, it is said that if you use a lateral infratemporal approach so specifically even in the peribulbar injection some we have the three approaches so the lateral one which is given the inferior lids at the junction of the inferior um the lateral two lateral one third and medial two third that is the le least vascular of the three sites and is the most uh, preferred one to prevent rbh avoid going too deep inside the globe avoid deep needle placement always prefer less than 31 mm and 
give pressure to the eye for at least one minute after injection don't leave the patient immediately after giving the injection and don't take him for the surgery the next major complication is we are talking about the globe damage globe damage could be globe perforation or it could be globe penetration in globe perforation basically you have an entry wound and then you have an exit wound that means you take your needle will insert into the eyeball and then it will come out that is called globe perforation in penetration basically it just enters inside the eyeball and it does not come out so basically you are going to insert your anesthetic agent within the eyeball and that can sometimes even cause the eyeball to rupture now the reason why we get globe perforation is it is more common in eyes which are too big in size that is myopic patients with axial length more than 26 millimeters and posterior staphylomatous eyes that means the eyeball is elongated in the posterior direction so it is more chances that you might go and hit the eyeball with your needle so how can you actually avoid globe damage by doing certain precautions or by doing certain techniques in patients of this category so myopic patients are high risk for globe damage so in them the anesthesia that you prefer is they say single medial peribulbar injection is more safer in these people and sometimes you can use a non-needle technique like a topical anesthesia or subtenons anesthesia so what are the other risk factors for globe damage apart from myopia patients who have enophthalmus that means the eyeball is too inside the orbit okay that is called enophthalmus that means inside eyeball it is totally opposite of what is proptosis so in proptosis you have an anterior protrusion of the eyeball and in enophthalmos the eyeball is much inside compared to the normal second is repeated injections the more times you prick the patient the more chances of damaging the globe patients who are not cooperative for anesthesia they might be constantly moving their eyeballs putting them at a greater risk for globe damage again patients who have undergone previous scleral buckling uh, procedures they are at more risk of developing globe damage because of the needle then when you're giving the anesthesia it is always important that when you uh, put when you give the block the bevel of the needle should always face the eyeball of the patient if you are going to turn it away to from the page from the glow that means you are going to put it a uh, flip side the the sharp point of the needle is going to hit the glow also if someone is a novice does not know the orbital anatomy and techniques properly and of course patients who have undergone previous rd surgery or who have had had corneal refractive surgery they are also known to have greater risk of this uh, damage so how do you identify a globe damage the patient will have severe ocular pain they might have sudden loss of vision and because you are perforating the globe there will be decrease in the tone or the iop that is called hypotony however let me tell you in globe penetration however the pressure of the globe is going to rise because you are injecting the local anesthetic directly inside the eyeball of the patient however it has been seen that most of the globe damages like perforation and penetration goes unnoticed and these symptoms might not come that means many patients are asymptomatic as well so after the globe uh, damage or uh, penetration perforation has been diagnosed it is better to cancel the surgery and refer the patient to retinal surgeon for an ophthalmoscopy and an ultrasound to assess how much damage we have done coming to the globe rupture as i told you after globe penetration sometimes when you actually inject the local anesthetic into the globe an anesthetic agent volume of even 2 ml is enough to cause the rupture of the globe so always suspect globe rupture if suddenly the corneal edema is increasing and there is resistance to the injection that means that you are inside the globe and if you have injected enough anesthetic agent and now the globe might rupture next serious complication is the optic nerve damage the optic nerve can get damaged either because of the direct needle stick injury that means you have directly hit the optic nerve or because of injecting more amount of anesthetic agent into the globe or sorry into the orbit because of which the pressure of the orbit will rise and there will be pressure necrosis from the local anesthetic agent within and around the optic nerve sometimes you might damage the ophthalmic artery which is present around the optic nerve that will lead to hemorrhage and it will form a hematoma and that hematoma can compress on the optic nerve and cause the optic nerve damage. 
So what are the risk factors for the optic nerve damage? Smaller orbit is a greater risk factor for the optic nerve damage. It is said that the lateral orbital rim, okay, that is from here inferiorly to the optic foramen which houses the optic nerve, the length is about 45 millimeters. So smaller orbit and with the needles that we use, they are greater risk of placement of the needle deeper into the orbit and we might go and hit the optic nerve. So it is better that we use the optic needles, uh, the anesthetic needles less than 31 millimeters and moreover the patient should always be looking straight ahead okay if he's in supine he should be looking uh, straight uh, up on the ceiling at the time of the block the reason is that when the patient looks in the primary gaze the optic nerve is usually placed on the medial side of the orbit okay and however if the patient looks somewhere else then the nerve might actually come onto your way of the needle and you might actually prick the optic nerve so that is very important that the patient is looking in the primary position and the needle should not be too long the other serious complication is the myotoxicity. It can happen because of the direct trauma that means you go and uh, damage the nerves, itself, uh, the muscles themselves and specifically certain anesthetic agents like bupivacaine is known to have this myotoxicity. Moreover, uh, sometimes the ischemic pressure just like the optic nerve can get damaged because of the excessive pressure. Similarly, by the large volume of local anesthetic agent, even the muscles can get damaged okay and uh, sometimes if you use high concentration of the drug not diluting them properly even then we can have myotoxicity in the order of their damage inferior rectus is the most common one to get damaged then we have the superior rectus which can get damaged and finally we can have levator palpebrae superioris which can get damaged and then we can have something called ptosis which is drooping of the eyelid now drooping of the eyelid is a very common post-operative complication that we see in patients who have undergone an ophthalmic surgery so this is very common on the first post-operative day and occurs in about 50 percent of the eye, eye operations this ptosis will usually resolve in about 95 percent of the patients by the fourth post-operative day and by fifth week almost in about 99% it will get resolved. So whenever a person comes with ptosis post-surgery, we don't uh, actually do anything. We manage them conservatively up to about five to six weeks. And later also, if they do not uh, improve, there's no improvement in the ptosis, then you have to suspect either the levator aponeurosis has uh, been damaged, that's called dehiscence of the levator aponeurosis, probably because of the excessive massage, probably because of the damage to the levator by the, mus uh, by the anesthetic agent or pressure necrosis because of a large volume of local anesthetic agent that we injected. Sometimes even the brittle suture that we place uh, in SICS specifically for the novice surgeons is also can also cause damage to the superior rectus and along with that the levator can also get damaged and sometimes the lid speculum itself can cause damage to the lid and can cause the ptosis. A very risky we can call deadly complication is an oculocardiac reflex. Now oculocardiac reflex is nothing but it is bradycardia and hypotension that means decrease in the heart rate and decrease in the blood pressure in response to the mechanical stimulation of the globe okay now this ocular cardiac reflex is commonly seen during the general anesthesia for eye surgery and especially in com is common in children okay it is not so common in adults it's more common in children and it's more common in the squint surgery because there we are specifically dealing with the uh, muscles now uh, how is the what is the pathway the pathway is the stimulations uh, will cause stimulation of the ciliary nerve specifically the long ciliary nerve which is present near the muscles and it will go to the ciliary ganglion from the ciliary ganglion the nerve the stimulation is carried in the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve which will again relay it to the brain from the brain the efferent pathway will start and it will carry uh, its impulses via the vagus nerve which is the 10th nerve to the heart and the vagus nerve is a parasympathetic nerve so it will bring down the heart rate and the blood pressure of the patient and this is called the ocular cardiac reflex now how do you abolish this ocular cardiac reflex by administering atropine to the patient and it is also said that prophylactic peribulbar and retrobulbar block along with 
the general anesthetic agent can also abolish this oculocardia reflex so as i was telling you stimulation of these long ciliary nerve along whenever there's a mechanical stimulation of the muscles this long ciliary nerves will get um, uh, stimulated and the impulse will be carried in the afferent pathway up to the ciliary ganglion in the ciliary ganglion route they are going to go travel in the ophthalmic branch of the cranial nerve 5 which is the trigeminal from the trigeminal ganglion it will reach the brain stem okay in the brain stem it is going to relay in the motor nucleus of the vagus that is the 10th nerve from the 10th nerve the efferent pathway will travel through the vagus nerve goes to the heart and the heart will not beat properly the blood pressure will go down and the heart rate will go down and this is called the oculocardiac reflex another complication is the central spread of the local anesthetic agent now this can happen in two ways number one is you know that the ophthalmic uh, the optic nerve is surrounded basically by the meninges okay and around the optic nerve we have the ophthalmic artery now either way what you can do is the ophthalmic uh, anesthesia the ocular anesthesia needle can penetrate this dura mater of the optic nerve and through the subdural space the local anesthetic agent can travel retrograde into the brain and th uh, this agent will go to different parts of the brain and based on which part of the brain will get anesthetized you will have various symptoms but the thing is this takes some time so it might take 15 minutes to develop symptoms of a central spread of local anesthetic agent through the tubular sheath of the optic nerve however sometimes you will inject the anesthetic agent directly into the ophthalmic artery and then the symptoms that you get will be quite immediately and mostly we get seizures this is because of the sudden retrograde flow of anesthetic agent from the branch of ophthalmic artery through the internal carotid artery directly to the midbrain as well and it can be quite deadly so symptoms will depend on which structure is getting affected in the brain so there can be problem in the temperature regulation there can be vomiting there could be temporary hemiplegia as well aphasia generalized convulsions palsy of the contralateral oculomotor third nerve trochlear nerve which is a fourth nerve along with a darkening episode which is called amaurosis is quite characteristic of the central nervous system spread so the patient tells you that there's suddenly loss of vision after the block and they will have problems with the temperature some patients will have vomiting and there will be paralysis episodes as well so how do you prevent it primary position is the answer always tell the patient to look straight ahead before delivering the block always aspirate to see that there's no blood in the needle hub to prevent intravascular injection another complication is the allergic reactions which are rare with amides okay like lignocaine or pivocaine it is more with the esters and basically it is occurring now these days because of the hyaluronidase component which is present within the blocks okay then there are complications with the ocular compression devices as well specifically the balls and the balloons and here the digital pressure is not very deadly it is advised that the pressure that we give to the eye should be less than 25 mm of hg or less and this pressure will not compromise the intraocular circulation okay and the device also if you are putting uh, put pressure intermittently if you're using a ball like this a honens device don't give pressure for more than 20 minutes okay because there known to cause uh, compromise the retinal circulation specifically in patients who have already old age they have atherosclerosis these patients can land up into central retinal artery occlusion central retinal vein occlusion and a lot of ischemic conditions of the retina so that was about the complications of ocular anesthesia specifically the needle associated complication thank you